Welcome to the Sport Exchange with me, John Robbie. Hi guys, welcome to the Sport Exchange podcast where we meet sporting personalities and learn about their lives and their life stories. Today in the Sport Exchange podcast, we meet one of the Blitzbok heroes who have basically kept the South African rugby flag flying high, while perhaps the Springboks and some, most of the Super Rugby sides have fallen behind. It's an amazing, amazing story. Kyle Brown, thanks for coming in and talking to us. Sure, thanks, John. Thanks for having me here. Kyle Brown, being a Blitzbok, what is it like? I mean, from being almost... Uh, a minor part of rugby, a gimmick when the Seven Series started. You are now superstars. What's it like? Well, I wouldn't even say that when it started. I mean, I think when I started in 2008, 2009, there wasn't much happening. You know, it was it was quiet. I mean, the, the circuit was established, but there wasn't a hell of a lot of interest in the game. And uh, I always actually say to people, I've been so lucky to be involved in the last 10 years of Sevens Rugby. I think it has exploded throughout the whole world and... Uh, uh, the you know the buy-in from the crowds and and you know the different venues we go to completely packed out every time we go there uh and to, again the venues we go to the you know some of the best locations in the world to play in some of the most uh, uh you know exciting extraordinary stadiums uh, fast-paced game people go you know people used to talk about hong kong being the most fun mm. hong kong is slowly slipping down the ranks uh, as other you know stadiums start to well, cape town is number yeah, one exactly surely. well it, amongst the players cape town is number one cape mm. town and, and cape town was number one the very first year that it came in so you know that now they've got a bullseye on their back and and uh, paris is up there and london is there and sydney's going crazy and uh, so I think it's it's been an incredible time to be part of Sevens Rugby and, and uh, just to be part of the growth and uh, been on, on the journey while it's happened has been cool. What would you be doing had you not been invited to play <laughs> Sevens? You, ever th- you must have thought of that. Yeah, so at the time when I was, uh, when I was invited, I was actually at UCT uh, studying business sciences in my second year. And I got a, I got a very strange phone call from Paul True. And it was, it was another one... Uh, you know, you spoke earlier about there's obviously this timing and this talent, but then there's also luck. Mm. And the one was the, the reason why I got a call from Paul True was I was playing for UCT rugby and we had played Varsity Cup, the first Varsity Cup 2008. You got into the final and lost to Martins, yeah. I think. Yeah. yeah, we had a phenomenal season yeah. that, you know, we also we, we went into the tournament ranked eighth and was, uh, you know. Were you a flank? You were playing on the flank? Yeah, we were the English team in an Afrikaans tournament, so we didn't know how to play rugby. So, you know, you, you get ranked eighth. And uh, then, so that year went by, and around September time, we started testing for preseason for the next Varsity Cup. Tested on a Monday night uh, at Sports Science in Cape Town. You know, quiet Monday night. Everybody's coming off the back of a long season. They're tired. I'd been with Western Province under 21 and had played seven minutes of rugby the whole season. So... Good shape, not too knocked up or anything. And uh, I tested very well. I tested well on a Monday night. What do you mean testing? Uh, speed testing, strength testing, fitness, mm. those kind of things. So they, they do it at the beginning of the season to get a baseline of where everybody is. Mm. Then they'll test again probably before the season starts at the end of preseason to see where we are, how many adjustments need to be made. Um, and I tested well. The very first preseason testing was uh, was a good one. Myself and Matt Turner. I don't know if you remember Matt Turner played on the wing for, I do. for West, uh, Western Province. He played on the wing for UCT during that first Varsity Cup. And he was actually joint top try scorer with uh, Marcelo Sampson. Jeez, so we, bo- both our wins. Yeah. Both, uh, both our wings were top try scorers, number one and two, which was a great season. Um, and, and funnily enough... Uh, at the sports science, our biokineticist in the sevens team at that time had left sports science the year before. So he still had mates there. And, you know, I think they'd drop him a text every now and then. This guy tested well. Mm. You should have a look. And I assume that's what happened. And next morning, uh, I, I got a voice no, a voicemail from, from Paul True. And I honestly thought it was some kind of a joke. So I phoned back and it was Paul True. And he said, would you like to come to training this evening? And I thought, well... Why not? I suppose I, I don't have yeah. lectures. <laughs> um, and I went to training in Belleville, and we played against Western Province. And to my knowledge, I didn't I didn't know what I was doing. I've never really played sevens properly before. And but I think that's the one of the biggest challenges for for coaching in sevens and selecting players in sevens is you don't have a feeder system. Mm-hmm. So now you have to find the characteristics and find the 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 skill sets that would apply to sevens, and see if a player is exhibiting them in fifteens. You know, so there's what what are the skill sets? I mean, obviously speed is the number one thing, but there's a lot more to it than that. And obviously defense and bravery 
is is massive. I mean, that's what's put you guys ahead. Tell me the sort of the, the ideal young player to 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 have a sevens career. So I don't I don't know if speed is number one. I don't think speed is number one because we don't. Uh, you know, I'm not the quickest, and neither mm. is Chris, and neither is Philip. But um, so I think work rate is number one. Mm. Work rate is key. Uh, and it's work rate. And so often you'll, you'll stand next to the field watching maybe a club game or something and a guy comes, oh, wow, look at the 13. He's phenomenal because he steps well or mm. he, he does something. And then I'll say, okay, well, let's watch him. What happens when the ball gets turned over? And, you know, somebody line breaks and he turns around and walks back and says, yeah, that's why he won't make it with us. Yeah, because yeah, those yeah. are the things that, and, and that's when you talk about that bravery, that's the bravery that that's, so often shown on the field, you know, by by somebody young charging back 60 meters to make a, line, a tackle 10 meters away from his line, make a turnover, and we're back in the game again. You know, and that, those are the, the game changing moments. So you like the ideal youngster, he's he's pretty quick, and this say, say forward now. Ideal youngster, he's quite quick, fairly tall. Hmm. Aerial skills have become a, a phenomenal thing. The kickoff is so important because in sevens. Uh, if you score, you kick off again. You don't mm, receive. Mm. So if you watch Fiji's game, they score a try, they kick off, they win the ball back. They score another try, they kick off, they win the ball back. And if you don't break that cycle, you will lose by You're 40 dead. points yeah, very yeah, quickly. Yeah. Um, England, fantastic at their kickoffs. And they've got a kicker who can put it on the money every single time. You know, and So they'll have guys, they choose where we choose to line up all to one side. They, they split the field. Split it, yeah. And it exposes a lot of holes. In I mean, you've only got seven players uh, you want to start doing uh, two-man pods, then you know that's that that makes the field even bigger. Yeah. Um, so aerial skills fantastic to to have as a forward, but a size uh, quite quick. Offloading game is coming more and more into the game yes. now. Uh, we we haven't focused very much on the offloading game. We we play a much lower risk game, and we choose to set up phases, which is just part of, of, of what we do. It has a whole lot of benefits and it has a whole lot of drawbacks too, but mm. uh, probably less less drawbacks than it does benefits, I think. I think we are, we, we're comfortable in that space. It's amazing. And I want to get to the mental side of it a little bit later on. Before you got that voice message from Paul True, what was your life plan? I had played under 19 at Borland. I played under 21 at Burland. Then I played under 21 for when I was 21 for Western Province, but minimal rugby for them. Small for a flank for 15s. Were Small you? for a 15s. I, I got told that I should decide whether I want to play hooker or center at some point uh, because that's the yeah, only career yeah. path forward. And, you know, you throw the idea around a little bit, but um, I've never played hooker. I've never played center. So I can look like a complete clown if I decide now <laughs> at, a, at a fairly decent level of under 20 round rugby that I want to start changing positions and compete. So I stuck to my guns a little bit and, and played there and uh, I genuinely believe it was a timing thing. So it was, it was so funny listening to, to Neil earlier yes. talk about his, his, uh, his stepping into the under 21 team when he stepped past Neil Powell. Mm. The, the, the moment I got my starting spot was when Neil Powell broke his arm in Adelaide. Poor old Neil Powell. Neil right? is just creating, he just creates opportunities all over the place. But, but go back, what was, you, you, you had this rugby career, but I mean, did you think of being a full-time professional at that stage? After school, I, um, I, I went to Saks High School and mm. we had a phenomenal man, John Ince, who had built up this huge network of schools in England that, that afforded us the, the opportunity of a gap year. Mm. So I, I applied for the gap year early matric and or maybe early grade 11 or late grade 11. And it was it was confirmed and I was going on a gap year. And then Alan Zondach decided that he was going to start an academy called RPC. Mm. His idea was that there's so much talent in, in not even just South Africa, just the Western Cape alone that he will take a bunch of guys that nobody else wants. He'll grow them up uh, for a year in, in the rugby performance center, which was uh, situated in Belleville. At N, you remember NNK? Hmm. NTK, I'm not sure what they're called. But just over the road from that, he bought a, uh, a complex there with about four houses on, got all these guys together. And then he approached me in, in matric and said, do you want to, do you want to come? And I said, oh, I'm, I'm flattered. I'd love to, but I've committed to this gap here. And it's, it was a, it was a, it was a, I didn't. I don't want to turn it down. You know, for the amount of work that John had put in and the connections that he made, and it was it mm. was a huge commitment as a schoolboy that you took upon. So I went on that year. The Where did you go? St John's Beaumont, oh, just yes. out, uh, just outside of Windsor. So yeah. in old Windsor, a smaller private school. Um, 
not quite the stories that I heard of a gap year. We arrived and our orientation was, right, you'll start work at seven in the morning, you finish roughly nine at night. And I was thinking, <laughs> how do I work my second job then? You know, where do I earn my money? Yeah. And, and the money was a lot smaller than I'd heard of too. So, yes. but now you're in it. And I, I suppose they should probably tell these the guys about these details before they arrive there. But, you know, I got on the plane and... <laughs> Welcome to the real yeah, world. Yeah, you know, that was the real world. And it was, but it was cool. So I ended up staying there. Uh, there were eight of us. There were eight gaps. There four from, uh, six from Australia and two from South Africa. I was, I was from Cape Town. The other guy was from Durban. Um, and it was, it, it went very well. I had a fantastic year. I got to travel. I did one of those Contiki trips through yeah. the, the summer holidays. So I saw the whole of Europe with, with, uh, there were actually 10 mates from Sax that all somehow we managed to communicate, which and we, I, I guarantee I couldn't organize this right now, but we yeah. managed to do this when we were 18 <laughs> and get 10 of us on the same bus that only took 35. So we were by far the biggest crew on the bus, you yeah. know, and we traveled Europe like this and some wonderful stories. Um, but then also I did, you know, I, I didn't have time to train. I had no way of training. So I had made the decision that I was going to leave at the end of September, Yeah. which I'd been there for most of the year. I'd, I'd given a lot and I'd just miss, I'd been missing the last two months. And I went in, I sat down with the, the headmaster and I tell him, I, I've got this opportunity with the rugby academy um, and I really want to be prepared when I get there. And he, he understood and uh, so I left, I came back to South Africa, buggered around a bit, just hit the gym a lot. <laughs> it, was a, it was a very quiet time in my life. I probably, mm. I gymmed and partied more than expected. Um, and then I, then I went to, to Alan Zorndark's academy and it was, it was awesome, it was a fantastic year and it helped me grow a lot in confidence because I, I didn't play Craven Week. I didn't even go to Craven Week trials. Mm. So these, these too are small, too, too small, too small, uh, too, yeah, too, not, uh, yeah, not, not a great school to be, you know, not a, not a rugby school, not yeah. an identified rugby school. So, um, whereas poorest would send the entire first team plus a couple second team guys. Yeah. I think Sachs would get a, a shot at sending a couple first team guys. And I wasn't, I wasn't what they were looking for, I suppose, which was fine. You know, it's, it's okay. But what were your ambitions? Was it just to say, I want to have a little bit of rugby? I mean, at that stage, you weren't thinking of representing no. South Africa. No, you? at that stage, I was thinking, let's, let's give it a crack. It was yeah. one of those things, I want to have a go. And, and, and Alan lived five houses down from my dad in Bloberg. So he's a lovely guy. He's got a lot of experience in rugby. And he's, he, he's incredibly passionate about Absolutely, rugby. And when he speaks yeah. to you about it, he grabs yeah. you, you know. Yeah. And, and he's, I've got this plan, you know, and, and Western Province and this one, they can, all the academies can take the first five, 15 players. Yeah. So 45 players or, or, or whatever it was, 55 players. And, 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 and he can take all of them and I'm going to take the next bunch, you guys, and, and we will beat them. We will beat all of them. <laughs> oh, I'm on board with that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it was a great season. We actually played in the, uh, the, the Western Province League, Super League A, and um, in the under 20 section. And we beat in my year. We beat Marty's twice. We beat UCT twice. So it was wow. a it was a huge yeah. year. We got a lot of guys, and we 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 sat in this funny position where we could play for province or for Bulan. So Bulan trials were held first. You go to Bulan yeah. trial or province trials were held first. Go to province. You didn't go there. You went. You made up the, the rest of the Bulan team. So most of the Bulan 19 and 21 team were from RPC, but still no real ambition to think that okay, rugby is going to be my life. So what was your life going to be? Um, I was business science uh, and then I was still trying to figure out my major my, my first major was uh, uh, information systems because mm. I like computers I thought computers were interesting mm. but I mean on an entry level I thought computers were interesting yeah. and first semester I, ro I rocked up at my first commercial programming lecture and the, the lecturer says this, this semester we'll be programming in C++ and half the crowd laughs and they giggle ah, and I go <laughs> And C plus <laughs> plus, and so immediately I felt out of my depth. And it's one of my small regrets would be, um, you know, marching up to the faculty and saying, "I'm out. I'm sorry. I can't. I'm way out of my depth here. Mm. I should have stuck it out." Um, I still like computers, and I still believe that that information systems are the future, as they mm. are currently presenting. They will just get more and more entrenched in life. And I, I wish that I had stuck there. Right. So I changed to finance, um, accounting, and. Uh, <laughs> And then I dropped to finance non non CA. So there's a finance CA and finance yes, non CA yes, route yes. for rugby players. Yeah, generally you start finance <laughs> CA because you've got great high hopes, and then yeah. then it progresses, and I got finance non CA, and then rugby took over. Yeah. And um, and then then I got a professional contract, and that was 2000 and 
What was your profession? How much was that? 2000 and what was it? 2008? 2009. Nine. Yeah, 2009. What, 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 what was a professional contract in 20,000 rand. A year? Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. 20,000 rand a month. Oh, a month. Yeah, yeah. So not, not, a, like, not a pittance. But that's not bad. I yeah. think actually, I, I don't actually remember. I think it was maybe 15 or 20. It wasn't, wasn't huge. I think the top contract at sevens at that time was 30, 35. Right. So they had A, B, C categories, and it was like 35, 25, 15. And how many 15. were contracted sevens? I think around that time. We, so we were, they called, you know, we were the first people to centrally contract players. Yeah. Because for so long, because of the, the, the image of sevens and the way it was um, not, you know, widely appreciated in the, the greater rugby community, mm. it was, you know, get together for two weeks and go on your trip and it was guys that weren't making super rugby maybe or weren't making the provincial teams yeah they get together they throw around um you can play some rugby so so let's go represent south africa or something like that and then there was paul true's vision to centrally contract let's make a home base let's prepare these guys properly you know get a strength and conditioning coach on board um and they had a they had a long long meeting the the year before i joined 2007 they there's this epic meeting that I will. I've, I've never. I was never part of it, but you no, hear sure. about it no, all the time. Tell us about it. Tell us the legend. It was like a five-hour meeting in Bondi Beach where they explored their identity and explored the culture and and the. Or I suppose the beginnings of the culture and what this team was to represent and what was the plan going forward and and that was the beginning of a of a slogan. I don't know if you would have ever seen it called Pioneers of Greatness. No. And and that's so that's something that's kind of attached to our team. And pioneers because it's something that nobody has done before. And centrally contracting and starting a professional seven setup was something that they wanted to start. And and greatness was the, the you know the connotation behind greatness was um, years of sustainable, I want to say excellence, but of great uh, good solid rugby. And mm, I think mm. I think that's something that we've represented for a fair amount of time. Absolutely. Um, the the funny thing is the funny thing is that that meeting was in two thousand and maybe eight or seven the year before I got there and we won the series in eight, nine. And, and in all honesty, if you, I think if you chat to Paul now, he'll tell you that was a problem. Like success shouldn't have come that early. Ah. You know, it shouldn't have come that early. You know, the following year we came sixth, I think in the world. Yes, I remember that. It was very disappointing. Very disappointing. I think it was sixth and then maybe third and then fifth. Yeah. So it was a really challenging couple of years. And the, the problem I think one of the main problems was that the success came too early, you know, and maybe we were ahead of our time in, in centrally contracting, but it was supposed to be a gradual progression to something that was going to last over time. And it has, but we had our speed bump straight after. Oh, wow. Okay. Well, world's number one. We've, well, we've got the formula. We've done yeah, it, you know, it's, yeah, it's yeah. sorted. And then the next year, uh, you know, you lose a couple of players and, and you think that you are, you know, shooting sun rays um, out of your backside and, and then you land on your backside very quickly. And, um, so and what was that like? What did that do to this very, spirit, to the family? Very humbling feeling. Very, very humbling feeling. And, and I think that's, that's where, if you chat to, to Cecil Africa now, uh, he's got this, this, uh, this theory about the uh, transference of knowledge of the culture and the understanding of the culture of how it grew over time to the younger guys and, and, and the new guys coming in. It's a very difficult thing to do. Mm. Very, very difficult thing because they weren't there through the dark days. So it's times when, when we couldn't get past the bloody quarterfinal. It, was, it would kill us. We would make pool stages would be fine and we couldn't get past the quarterfinal. You play in the, 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 the plate every other weekend and it's soul destroying. Yeah. Soul destroying. It is a horrible place. The plate is the worst place to be. It's, it, uh, and just <laughs> after that is the third, fourth place playoff. But yeah. the plate is terrible because you're not really playing anything. The best you get is fifth place. Yeah. That's it. You know, but it all counts at the end of the day. The points count at the end. But but when you when you aren't making consistently semifinals and and into into the cup race, it's a tough place to be. So that is what that did was. I think that brought us right back down to earth again. Good. And then, and then yeah, hundred um, percent. And from there on, was uh, then there were a couple decisions that needed to be made in terms of of players, and that's and that's why you know when I was chatting to you about after after Neil's discussion, mm. there's so many similarities between it and he between spoke, Saracens and between sevens. Between that between Saracens of that time yeah. and, and and sevens of this time was to have that core group of players that stuck around. So. When I was when I started there, then you had a couple of guys that would come in and then they would bounce out again. And it was essentially a stepping stone. 
And because it was all I'd ever known, sevens was all I'd ever known, this was my heart and this was my love and I respected this. Mm. But for me, when players were coming in and then, you know, they get a little bit of limelight, then they get picked off by a 15s unit and that was like, I feel a bit disrespected. A, slap you know? in the face. a little bit of a slap in the face. For one, you know, we've done a lot of work to develop a lot of players and then the moment they get a shot somewhere else, they go. Yeah. And it's difficult. So, so you know, then the decision had to come what, what was happening with players. And there were a couple of us that decided that sevens is what we wanted to do and sevens is where we wanted to stay. And, and What sort of input did you have? Was it the old traditional South African rugby where you had the coaches and the presidents and you basically did what you were told? Or did you say, hang on a second, we want to be part of this? In, in what sense? The- in terms of, of, of what you're talking about, making decisions about players, about status, etc. As players, did you have input into it? So I think when you, you have coaches like Paul True and, and Neil Powell, you, you get people where you can have open conversations with them. It's, mm-hmm. not, it's not something that we, are, we bow down at every moment. We, the, the conversation is free-flowing and we can talk about what we're feeling. And, and I, I, I probably spoke to him many times about that in the past, Paul initially. Yes. And, and the idea was that I want to make sevens my thing now and let's do this because he had an idea to grow sevens. Uh, he, you know, you talk about big thinkers. Paul True is an enormous thinker. He wants to think big and grow things into wonderful and, and um, concentrate on perfection and excellence and things like that. And that's, that was the only way that Sevens was going to be taken Has he seriously. Not got the, are you saying he hasn't got the credit? Because Neil has done a fantastic job, but it's almost like we've forgotten that Paul True was the start of it. Well, I, I, I mean, we haven't forgotten. I yeah. mean, I don't remember. I don't forget his fitness sessions for one. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. But I, I know full well his, uh, the influence he had on this setup in setting up the foundations of what we have today. Right. Without Paul having set up what he did, without central contracting, without setting up um, the base of the culture, it, w- it wouldn't be where it is today. Neil's come in and he's taken it to a brand new level, yeah. um, refined things, uh, the personal side of things, dealing with people uh, has been Neil's absolute forte. He's, he's been able to you know draw out the absolute best in each of the players just by the way he's communicating the relationships he's formed with them. When a new player comes in, what happens? Let's say you get a brilliant young fast winger comes in, whatever, he's gone through the tests, etc. And they say, right, he's in. What, how, 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 do you, how do you school him? So there's, there's a lot to learn. Um, I think that the current system of, of the Grand Coma and the Craven Week and the SA schools um, sometimes creates a bit of a bubble for the boys that are moving through that. And I had the opportunity to talk at Craven Week this year on mm. Monday night, but I was in the capacity of my players and they are the representatives of, of, uh, of players in South Africa. So it's, it's kind of like the trade union for the players. Mm. And I, and I explained to them that and because there's a lot of swagger walking around at Craven Week. There's a lot of kids that are floating on cloud nine. And of course, they've made it. Yeah. Well, that's the thing. You know, you've made it. You're 18 years old. You, you're playing for Craven Week. And I, there was just some very quick maths. Okay. So there's a thousand contracted players in South Africa, professional contracted players at the moment. There are 750 boys sitting in this assembly today. Yeah. 750 of you. How many players do you think are leaving to make way for you? You know? Mm. And every single year, there's 750 of you. There were 750 last year, 750 next year, and the year after that. So let's be real about this. How many of you are actually going to get a contract? And it's a very quick maths. I mean, I'm I'm probably far off. You know, not not maybe not too far off, but I'm probably a little bit. But that was the idea. The idea was a little bit of shock value. Yeah. You know. And so we get we get. uh, Luckily, these days we bet we we're we're better off getting. Not sorry, not better off. We are are better at getting more of the talented SA schools players in the past uh, there was no hope for us mm, we wouldn't get mm. an SA schools player because we couldn't uh, we couldn't afford them for one and it wasn't a hell of a draw card you know to come play sevens now it is now it's a it's it's a great developmental tool we've signed a, quite a lot of those uh, tripartite agreements so it's um, SA rugby the, cl- uh, the 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 union mm. and a um, and the player themselves and so we have a lot of players, uh, especially the younger ones. Somebody like Miller Duplessis is a classic case of this. He came out of, I think it's Paul Jim, very talented young young boy. And uh, he played for us for most of the season till I just, I think he just missed the last one. Then he played the under 20s and now he's with his union playing uh, uh, provincial rugby there. Um, but that, so what, what do you say? So what's it like getting them in? When the guy comes in. So first of all, they, they come in, like I said, floating on cloud yeah, nine. Yeah. And then there's a, 
we don't really have a hierarchy so there's no oh you are scum of the earth kind of thing you need to work your way up and that's so that's number one for us we we have a fairly uh, small setup and we've tried to crush the hierarchy so um, it's the players there's then there's a senior group of players which are they aren't treated any different Mm. to there's there are very few privileges that come along with that Um, when when Neil earlier was talking about drivers of culture they're expected to be the drivers of culture and and so if you name the, the senior group now um cecil philip chris dry uh justin Geduld, vanner myself mm. these are players branco dupree that they've been around for a very long time they understand what this is about and they're the ones driving and they they take neil's message and they they filter mm. it through i've done a fair bit of that you know those those corporate talk things and the one of the first thing i talk about when somebody joins is inclusion it's the number one most important thing for me when when a person arrives at the door is to include them yeah you know so so many places a guy arrives and he is now a threat to everybody around him whereas and then he's you know it's one of those guilty until proven innocent situations (laughs) we try flip it around yeah because so this is another another reason because we've only had players for very short spaces of time we don't have six to twelve months for a guy to prove himself you know he arrives we need him at his best in a week or two you know, so it's, we spin it around. You are innocent. You are part of us until you tell me that you don't want to be. Right. And that I think falls in with that conversation about this is the culture and somebody falling by the wayside because we're not, we're not asking you to do superhero things here. We're asking you to be a good human and live by a set of values that are very decent values, not outside the boundaries of being uh, just a solid gentleman. And um, so it's to include, include as quickly as possible. The, the, the quicker you can make a guy feel at home, you can make him feel comfortable, the quicker he starts performing to where he should be because then he, he worries less about off-field mm, things mm, and he can mm. worry about expressing himself on the field. And that's what we need out of him in, in, at the end of the day. We need him to be a, a, a lucky guy off the field and to give his best on the field. And if he's going to feel unsafe, uh, threatened at every corner and everything that he does, he has to check his back and who's coming after me. Yeah great example i mean i think i'll use frankie for an example of almost everything frankie will take now this is uh, uh frankie 68 tournaments back to back you know he's the he, he's the only one that'll do that in south africa i doubt there'll ever be another player mm. to play 68 tournaments back to back it'll never happen again because people get injured you know i don't know what happened to him but somehow he, he made that <laughs> frankie will take somebody who's coming in as a new tight end he'll take he'll sit with him for a couple hours and unload all the knowledge he has on him everything he's learned for the last eight or nine years of playing rugby he gives it to him and says you know like we need you to be as good as possible and it's a situation well i give you all my knowledge now come try to take my place yeah 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 because you're not going to because there's <laughs> you know there's there's a lot more than just the knowledge there's something in here you know that yeah. and, and that's it's a very idealistic thing to say but you know it, it is uh one of the the biggest tests was before the olympics we had I think eight Springbok players come to join us. And then there was a massive discussion in the media about, oh, that's so unfair. These guys work so hard to play sevens rugby their whole lives. And then, you know, the Springbok players just come in and take their place. And <laughs> How many got in? How many, you know? And, the, and, and for, for... What did a guy like Brian Habana feel? Brian is... Brian's just a special person. Yeah, of course. The, the, you know, and I didn't particularly know all of this before, yeah. but he joined and he completely humbled himself from the get-go. So, I mean, you know, and you always talk about that kind of thing, you know, sweeping the sheds, kind of that kind of chat about taking your bags off the bus. Yeah. Brian's the first guy to jump off the bus and grab bags and everything like that. And this is, this is one of the, you know, the most decorated Springbok wings of, of all time. But he, but he didn't make the team. He, is that, is that, he, is was, that he had a fairly honest discussion with Neil and he yeah. felt that he was a little bit out of his depth. And it takes time. It doesn't just take two tournaments. He had guts to say that from, 100%, from someone like you know, that. Eh? He he had he had the two tournaments. He had Vegas and and Vancouver. Mm. And after that, I think he he sat down with Neil and said, "I don't know if this is the right place for me." You know, it would have been it would have been. He, I think he's a great man for the team because he's you know he's here and off the field. He's wonderful and he gets the guys going. We were in Vegas and you know he was like, "Listen, we got to go do stuff. We're in Vegas yeah. now." You know, <laughs> and. Uh, so he's a wonderful person for the team, but he, um, he, like I said, he just completely humbled himself. And he how, was. How fit are you guys? Give us an idea of the fitness. I mean, give us an idea of a fitness. So, session. so let's go back to that discussion pre pre two thousand and sixteen yeah. when the eight Springboks came in. Yeah. And 
and there was a lot of uh, concern about especially some of the players that were maybe being picked sometimes and maybe not being picked and saying this is bloody unfair and mm. how can this happen and it was I, I suppose it was the responsibility of a lot of the senior guys to alleviate that and Neil Neil was incredibly open and honest about that and said no player will be picked without being properly tested so nobody's going to come in June when mm. I think the Olympics was in August and, and they're just going to be selected mm. So I think eight guys rocked up in about November. In the first week or two, about three or four of them were sitting on the on the touchline because of soft tissue damage. I mean, that, so the soft tissue damage is hamstrings, groins, course, calves, yeah, yeah. and that kind of thing happens when the intensity and the load is lifted too quickly. And it's it's just a different speed of game. That's all. I mean, and it takes some time to adjust. Mm. It's not that any one of them can't do it. It's just different. And I always explain that to guys because guys come from 15s and then the, they jump in and like, Whoa, the eyes are this big. And, you know, the f- Monday morning session, the Monday morning session, which is like a very uh, a standard, it's a staple, is a wrestling and a, a, a speed session with a wrestling and a bit of fitness in between. Mm. And it's ugly. It's not a nice session. Well, I think it's to blow the weekend cobwebs away. Yeah. So nobody likes it. Nobody does well at it. But a, a guy that comes in for his first day and gets that... He's ready to pack his bags and leave. He's no, I'm okay. Well. But give, give give us more speed. What so, do you do speed? So the the toughest sessions that we'll get, we don't do. I mean, we very seldom do, unless it's preseason. We won't do running, just running. Yeah. Because it's mindless. It's difficult. It's painful, and nobody likes it. Yeah. Um, we've got a hill session that we do. So if you drive out on the R44, there's a there's a left called Trimali Way. I'll never forget the name. And and it's just <laughs> after the new medic clinic, you take a left up there. And then if you look a little bit further up, then there's a hill. It's about yeah. 300 meters long. Oh. It is awful. It's a, it's a just a horrible, horrible session. That is a session on its own. How many hills will you do? Um, I think the most we've done is six, six long hills. So you'll do a long one, then you'll walk back down 100, then 100 sprint. Yeah. So it's the, the endurance and then the speed. Endurance Ouch. and yeah. speed. Um, the toughest sessions we got, and these are, are these are character testing, fitness testing, or defense sessions. Yeah. Because the toughest thing in sevens is probably to defend. Well, you were the first team that really said, if everyone is now attacking, yeah. you came out one year and you were smashing Fijians backwards and everything. Yeah. It was unbelievable. Tell, tell us about that. That was almost like a, a, an evolution in, in sevens, so, yeah, wasn't I, it? I th- yeah, because everybody looks at sevens, you toss the ball yeah. around and uh, let's have some fun, you know, throw the ball around, make it, you know, look lacquer and enjoy yourself. And I think Paul concentrated a lot on defense and then Neil is a very defense orientated yeah. man. Like he's, uh, it's, it's one of those, I think he's saying is a tackle when you games defense will win you tournaments yeah and he absolutely loves that and he wholeheartedly believes that and so defense is a massive uh, focus point for us um, and we I think we were one of the first to implement a rush defense yep which caught a lot of people off guard and I think now there's quite a lot of people doing it but it's a very time consuming thing you can't just rush rush defense takes uh you know linking between players communication mm. making your one-on tackles understanding of what teams are doing there's a whole there's a whole list of things that go to it but defense was was very special to us because it's a hard thing to defense you know you've everybody can make a tackle mm. especially if somebody runs at you if you can't make a tackle when somebody runs after you then you literally Shouldn't just a there. speed bump you know yeah. <laughs> but it's a it's very much a hard thing because it's it's tackle and up and tackle and up and tackle and up until and then the tough thing is is waiting for that turnover to come mm. and it will come it will you just have to be patient so i mean we've got a very uh, and this i'll gladly say this on on air because it's very easy to see so it's kick off land it try land it on the touchline and the 22 make the hit and now you're in your 22 and we're all all seven of us on our feet so we don't, we don't, we fear we don't even compete that first truck mm. because there's no point. We want to be seven off it. Now you must try play out of there mm. and we'll force you. And the number of times that it's a perfect game plan is kick off, make that tackle, um, leave the ruck alone, make, watch Vanner or Branko make a tackle in the midfield where the guy's fumbling the ball because mm. he's a meter away from his post. Uh, we turn over the ball, we pass it to Ciabello and he walks over. Scores in the corner. <laughs> that's, that's it, I promise you. And all I've done in that entire movement is make one tackle from the kickoff. Yeah. yeah. Philip follows up once on the inside, Vanna makes one tackle or Branko makes a tackle, Vanna turns it over, somebody passes. And that is, I promise you, when, it, when things are going well, you yeah. walk off the field like you haven't even done much. Yeah, yeah. It's a, it's a hell of a special feeling. When things are, you know, conversely, when things don't go well, you will run back 80 meters and you'll have to try and make a turn over there and it's uh, then you'll know that you've you've buggered up. <laughs> Tell us about I mean I, I've said it before and I don't think it's 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 got 
enough publicity. You're, you're not a sports team. You're a microcosm of what the new South Africa can be. There's no question about it. People yeah. from different backgrounds, different colors, everything, working together and pursuing excellence. Tell us about that. Are you aware of that, the symbolism that the sevens exhibit? So I, I am. Uh, I've been around for a long time and people often talk to me about it and they say that, you know, are you so representative of the country and yeah. what you've done is so phenomenal. And so I'm, I'm quite aware of it. And, and then I was chatting about a couple of those corporate talks that I do. And the, and the third thing for me, of down the list, so it's not less important than the other. Third thing for me is dis- is diversity. Yeah, and I think so. So often you diversity and inclusion. So in- inclusion, uh, vulnerability. No, sorry, diversity second. Inclusion, yeah. diversity, vulnerability, and which will make up great relationships. Um, the diversity thing in South Africa. So often you hear in these in this day and age we have to deal with the challenges of diversity, mm. and I, I cringe inside. I absolutely hate it. Because the reason why the reason why we're successful is our diversity. It's not there's there's very few other things I'll attribute so strongly to, but our diversity. Mm. So if you look at so many of the other teams, and I always have a have a laugh, and or you know I've got this little um, story I tell about it's it's either bishops depending on my crowd or Australia. Yeah. <laughs> but you look across at the team, and it's uh, six foot two, brown hair, uh, and fairly good looking. And you know that's what you got, and you know you fit. You know pretty much what you're going to receive in a tackle and defense. They're going to give you that. You look at our team. You've got like you've got Chris, Philip, and myself up front. Then you've got uh, Justin Hadult, uh <laughs> Branco, Cecil Africa, um, Selvin Davids in the centers. They're now playmaking. Roscoe Speckman playmaking. Yeah. Well. And you've got Vanner and Ruan in the centers. That are running lines and and exploding on people and Van is going to try to rip somebody's head off the next time he meets them. <laughs> then you've got uh, uh, Seviwe Soyazapi shakes on the wing oh, with yeah. Sibelo Sanadla. So, you know, so I mean, we've got these this multi pronged attack that yeah. that you give us a defense, show us something, and we'll find a way around it. You know, we've got this arsenal of tools that that yeah. is very difficult to compare to. And where does that come from? Purely our diversity. Very, very few places, very few teams are going to have such a diverse group of players that not just physically are diverse, yeah. but the way they think about things. And possibly that thinking has been shaped by their upbringing and the way, you know, the way they Is grew up. Is this something you discuss? I mean, it must, be, it must be an incredible education, living and working and traveling and winning and losing with people who come from this incredibly different backgrounds and and by design have been put into different pigeonholes in the past you've got this opportunity to maybe learn as as others haven't if you if you're conscious about it then you will be aware of it but it's not something we discuss because it's for us i mean i think it's uh, it's not something i would use uh, normally but we're colorblind you know it's yeah. not like, not a cliche. I mean, no, it's yeah. You know, in South Africa, we always oh, you know, we colorblind, but do they really mean it? Yeah, I, I don't think so. And we we very lucky where sport is our platform. That's what yeah. we do, you know. So everybody's there to achieve well in sport, and that's the underlying foundation that keeps us all together. And then when we get together, what are we? And the first thing we look for is just good people. Yeah. So and that's again one of those another cliches, and it's very difficult to um, to measure, but genuinely the talent that you have to get you an interview here at this team is just that it's an interview when you arrive and and you you show that you're you know you're there to to push your own agenda you're selfish you're not going to hang around very long Mm -hmm. and and so so we always talk you know you often talk about people first people first people first but it is people first you have to look after the people that you have here to bring out the best in them the moment that that gets taken away and we start concentrating on performance and we just want to to do well and at any cost you lo- you lose people along the way again similarities with with the saracens message where where, where, where to now i mean how, how old are you now 31 31 okay how long and what are your plans <laughs> so i did i did my acl in yeah. uh in may in singapore april may uh, unfortunately the second one in 18 months so i, I spent the whole of last year sideline i did my first ACL in December 2016. Bad. Yeah, I mean it's it's uh, it's unlikely that it'll happen that way. Yeah, I had pretty good knees my whole career, and then I, I I did it in Cape Town in December 2016. So I spent 
the whole of last year rehabbing uh got through the rehab process well made it back to this season and i enjoyed rugby this year i absolutely loved the season it was a bloody difficult season yeah. up and down and lots of new guys coming in and and so much i mean this year we used um the most players any team uh that's won the world series has ever used i think we used 28 players wow. throughout the season so remember at one point we've sent a whole team to commonwealth and i a whole remember team to yes yes massive yes. uh of of show of faith by by neil to a set of young guys to go play in that hong kong tournament they ended up coming third they were fantastic vital vital series points you know if they had bombed out from fifth six we there's no way we would have won the world series yeah so um going forward got to rehab the knee now uh and we are moving into contract discussions and i think um i don't know i've i've always said that i've i've had a great career so far so whatever happens next is just i suppose cream on the on, on the on top of and what about after rugby after rugby will you coach I think, will you coach i don't think You're i'm talking about coach. corporate presentations <laughs> i sense a theme well, i've chatted I've, I've done a couple of those in the last couple of weeks and it was so interesting listening to neil earlier when we were chatting yeah. and, and he said you know through my last year i did this mentorship program where i did i think the person he was looking for was a player development officer or player development yes, manager yes, pdm we were pdm and he developed that the workshop program and funnily enough in the about five weeks in a row i was up in joburg every monday or tuesday doing uh, corporate discussions with people and um it just seemed, the past seems so similar. I really need to chat to him a bit more. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. As um, long as it doesn't become contrived, as long as there's, yeah. got, there's got to be a real lesson there that something a corporate organization can take out of it. It's not just to get Kyle Brown to to make a nice little speech no, so we've got so, a blitz park with it in our midst. Exactly. So I, I don't do, I'm not big on war speeches. I don't mm. do... Um, I don't go. I don't get up, and, and I'm not a morale booster. I'm yeah. not. I'm not going to get up because it's not something we do here either. We generally the, the the sustainable thing is to keep people happy over a long period of time. Yeah. Yeah. To get them g'd up for two hours is very easy. Yeah. You can do that, but it's not going to last very long. Yeah. So we try to create a setup that that keeps people happy for a longer period of time. You know, um, and uh, you know, it's just yeah, it's not can't be contrived. Simple. We just, I just tell the story of the team. Yeah, not contrived. It's exactly my experience of the story of the team, um, what I've experienced over the last ten years of being part of. Uh, number one, a great team, and number two, a great team in in a, a, an awesome sport that's grown so aggressively over the Do you last. Think it's going to take over from fifteens. Uh, you know, you, I don't. You, you, you think uh, twenty years ago, T Twenty cricket, yeah. people would have laughed at compared to Test cricket, and yet look at it now. I think it's doing incredibly well, and especially, like I said earlier, the venues that they're now uh, going to are almost all of them are sold out every time. So in the past, there were four or five sold out, and then four or five that are you know iffy. not iffy, not incredibly well supported. And I think I think World Rugby do well to move. You know, they set up those two three year contracts. Um, once it doesn't go well, mm. doesn't prove itself, then they move it on to somewhere else. And um, so I think the tournaments themselves have been run incredibly well at the moment. They're starting to understand, you know, the the, the base formula for it, and they yeah. get it right almost every single time. Um, I the one thing that was difficult to watch was the World Cup. Was the knockout stages from get go is is mm. difficult because. Mm you do want to see the pool games. You know, you want to see everybody play everybody and ups and downs and then, oh, somebody just sneaking through in the to the quarterfinals and then it's set up well for day two. But every game is a final. I tell you, yeah. it's from the outside. That's, <laughs> oh, it doesn't get tougher than that. So I might I might argue with you. And, and, and personally, I mean... Um, you say you're various. Are you involved in anything anything commercial apart from the speeches now? Um, I, I, have you cashed in on the fame? <laughs> Let's be well, honest. no, 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 no. So the, my concentration has been with the rugby for the last ten years, and it's 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 a difficult space because you know exactly like Neil mentioned earlier was how do you commit to anything when you have no idea when you're going to yeah. stop playing rugby? But that must scare you a little bit. Incredible. Yep. So there's, there's, there's good options and there's good people to chat to and there's a good yeah. network. Yeah. But my, my issue right now is I have a fantastic network and no idea what to ask them for. You know, so, so I got this great network and wonderful people I've met throughout time. Because listen, three years ago, I did realize that I need to start Yes, you know, yes. meeting people. And when we go to the corporate events in Dubai and Vegas, and you need to meet people. You need yeah, to talk to yeah, them. You need to yeah. get a business card, you know. And people are more than willing to chat to you. And people are incredibly helpful if you open your bloody mouth. 
Yes, yeah? exactly. If you stand in the corner and drink your cool drink all night, then you're not going to meet anybody. <laughs> you know, and, and so there's this network and yes, some wonderful people, but I don't know. So, so you spoke. Did you early. finish your degree in the end? Yes, I you did. You did. Finish my degree. So you're a degreed superstar, superstar Blitzbach player who's got an interest in rugby and a massive network. You've so just got to find that next step. Get eh? you to write my Gumtree ad for me. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I did. I did finish my degree. That is that is a whole other story in itself. Started rugby professionally 2009, 2010-11. I'm a rock star. I don't need to study. Yeah. Uh, so I didn't do anything. Um, and then I think I got my first real injury end of 2012 and I was like right I need to get back on the books took its time um, did about six uh, six modules a year good and ended up finishing the end of 2015 started 2006 fantastic it was a hell of a slog but I was fairly committed to getting it so yeah. you know and, I, and what is your message as, as we're coming to the end now I mean as somebody who's come through to superstardom through an unusual route in rugby because timing as you say luck and uh, and ability to some youngster there who's thinking of a career in rugby what would you say <laughs> uh I, earlier you said um that one of the springbok captains said they, they wouldn't have taken rugby and yeah it's not that i wouldn't have taken rugby but um i would ask the youngster to be more realistic about things yeah and 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 you know, we asked, we were chatting about what is the best way to get the message across to guys. And I think testimonials work well, having conversations, getting guys to talk in front of them and say, listen, this is my experience. Mm. I have I have a very strange, bittersweet feeling about rugby because for me, I was very lucky and my pathway took me one way and it, and it, it went well. How many of my mates pushed to the age of 24, 25, hanging on to a dream yeah, yeah. no education no money 26 years old now they've got into the workplace not having finished a degree and maybe families yeah, maybe families kids. and it hurt me to see that and if, and i felt resentful towards rugby because you know you gave them this hope but you provided them with nothing in the, in the interim yeah. and so so education absolute must like i i honestly feel that every academy you play rugby and you sign that you will study at the same time absolute must because there's there's no other way about it because we can't get it's very difficult for us to get real world experience in the corporate space so this whole idea you've got the one day off in a week yeah. so we got wednesdays off now i'm supposed to go to a corporate and and uh and, and shadow somebody one day a week it's not meaningful it doesn't last i've also got admin to run you know mm. like I, I know that doesn't sound like a lot but i'd like to do things i like to get my hair cut yeah i don't have that opportunity monday <laughs> tuesday thursday friday <laughs> you know i'd also like to spend a little bit of time with my kid our training sessions we arrive at 7 30 in the morning eight between seven and, and eight in the morning and you go until like four three four possibly five full day. so buggered yeah full day gym sessions video analysis field sessions possibly two field sessions a heel session out on their skills individual group skill sessions throughout the day um there, there's plenty does it ever of become today. going to the office um thursdays are tough because you've had monday and tuesday and tuesday they're normally rock your world because you've got an off day on wednesday but yeah. somehow you have not recovered by thursday yeah, morning yeah um, and it's Thursdays are tough. And then generally they're going to smash you on Thursday too because Friday's a bit easier. But I suppose it makes the tournaments fantastic. Turn for a long time, training was so bloody difficult that just getting on the plane was an absolute relief. <laughs> the, the, you, a Saturday before the next Saturday, they can't kill us anymore. There's no way. Yeah. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, been, it's been a great career, but I, I would honestly, I would... I would if I chatted to youngsters, I'd say that it's it's a difficult, difficult word. It's a lot more difficult than you think it is. Yeah. A lot more difficult. And the the highs are, are matched up equally with a lot of the lows. And and you must remember that, you know, any job that, that most people do is not up for public scrutiny. Anything that we do is a guy at, at checkers or at pick and pay or on the side of the road walking on the pavement will tell you just how bad you were that weekend. Do you do you get coached in that? Do, 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 do they talk to you about dealing with the public, about PR, about, you know, exactly how you're seen by the public? I think you understand that you represent something. You represent a, a, essentially a company and a brand. And yeah. our brand, SA7s, is something that we're incredibly proud of. So to go out there and to smash back at somebody and say, listen, bugger off, man. You yeah, couldn't have yeah, done yeah, any yeah. better. Is adds absolutely zero value to this world, you know? But you think people appreciate it. Is it something that's discussed? Is it something that is uh, managed? Not, not 
particularly we do have a fair bit of media training where mm. we're eased into media conversations with uh you know journalists and mm. you won't be thrown in the deep end with a 60 yeah, minutes yeah. and so a lot of us are a lot better at deflecting than others um so some of the older guys if they know it's a difficult conversation then we'll get put in front of the camera as opposed to would you like young. to coach no i don't think so no it's it's um i've had a great career in rugby i've loved every moment of it but i still i've i've gained a lot of interests mm. um having had seven operations medicine is a deep interest of mine <laughs> <laughs> so you you learn to understand the body a lot um it was always an interest yeah. so I, there's i think there's there's definitely um space for you know the influence of technology in sport yeah i think that's a growing world with you know the understanding of that you know big data and um, data analysis and and how we can understand sportsmen better and how absolutely. we can get absolutely so, um I suspect it's not the last we've heard. Or when you hang up your boots, I suspect <laughs> it's not the last we've heard. Kyle, congratulations on a fabulous career and thanks for talking to us. Thank you very much. Thanks for the time. What an amazing story. The seven success told to us by Kyle Brown. Special thanks to Stellenbosch Academy of Sport. Have you seen the facilities here? Absolutely world class. Don't forget to subscribe on iTunes or your favorite podcast app and follow us on social media at TSE Advisory to make sure you don't miss out. Thanks for listening. Cheers from John Robbie.